Imagine if you were a superhero tasked with saving the world of Pokemon from an army of supervillains. Well, Pokemon Heads and Tails does exactly that, featuring killer robots, explosions, as well as some downright insane stuff. I played this wild game in its entirety, and it's crazy. Here's what happened. So, this is me. And since I'm a hero in this game, I decided to name myself after the biggest hero I know, Keegan J. What an honor this truly is. Our heroic adventure takes place in the brand new Metropia region. We start out in Prima Village by being introduced to our rival, a diabolical villain with a heart of pure evil. Jigen K, the arch villain to rival all arch villains. Oh, and this is Trevor. The three of us are the lucky trio chosen to receive a starter Pokemon. While on the way to the professor's lab, we learn the juicy lore that Metropia used to be dominated by an evil Poke villain, Mr. Apocalypse. That is, until five years ago, where the hero, Pokeman, defeated Mr. Apocalypse, banishing him into hiding. Despite that, the evil organization, Team Kaiser, continues to terrorize the region, and several other villains have reared their evil, ugly heads. But before we fully dive into exploring Metropia, a short word from our awesome sponsor. The Red Magic 9 Pro is a smartphone built for gaming. If you try to use just any old smartphone for gaming, it won't take long for it to overheat and start dropping frames, which is really frustrating. But the Red Magic 9 Pro is built different because this phone is packed with tech and features to give you the best gaming experience possible. Starting with a cutting edge Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 processor for lightning fast performance. It also includes a huge battery and super fast charging to keep you gaming on the move as long as possible. But one of its most impressive features is the onboard ICE cooling system, which prevents overheating and keeps your game running smoothly. Design-wise, the phone looks incredibly sleek. This is the Snowfall version with a design that's cool, but isn't too over the top. And the fully customizable RGB lighting is a really nice touch. But to improve the gaming experience even more, the Red Magic 9 Pro's game space gives you quick access to a ton of useful in-game features like timers and plugins. Combine all this with a highly responsive full HD screen as well as shoulder triggers to give you even more button options and you've got a seriously powerful gaming phone. I've used my Red Magic 9 Pro on my favorite games and never had any issues. The phone feels great and runs super smooth with an overall great presentation. It's an amazing phone and Red Magic are currently celebrating their sixth anniversary. So follow Red Magic on social media and click the link in the description below to check out the sixth anniversary celebrations. Our adventure had only just started, yet we would instantly be confronted by one of these heinous thugs, Psyduck. Wait, why are you locked up, Psyduck? Psyduck. Anyway, the starters in this game are completely new fan-made Pokemon. So let me know in the comments which of these three you would pick. For me, however, I decided to go with... Chilldrop, our very first hero, a pathetic wet pile of sludge. Now with our starter secured, in this game, we have two objectives. One, become the strongest hero of the region by defeating the champion. And two, defend Metropia from the evil Poké villains who threaten to destroy it. And straight away, we see their evil deeds in action as Team Kaiser has literally blown up a road. This blockade means that we have no choice but to proceed into the Zubat cave, and it's here that we find the culprit in hiding. He challenges us to a fight, and I'm terrified. This man just used an electrode to destroy a road. What kind of powerful Pokemon could he possibly... Okay, I'm not sure how someone with a level 6 Aaron could cause so much destruction. Anyway, after quickly defeating the Kaiser soldier, he flees like a coward, and I do absolutely nothing to stop the criminal. I truly am the best hero who has ever lived. With the criminal dealt with, now we're clear to explore Prima Village. And while most regular Pokemon gym leaders are just normal people, the Metropia gym leaders are wild. These are some of the strangest heroes I've ever laid eyes on. Case in point, the Prima Village's leader is Hercules, and he looks like this. This Crash Bandicoot looking, Plank from Ed, Ed and Eddie looking loser couldn't even take on a Termite, let alone Team Kaiser. To make things worse, Hercules is a bug trainer, the most pathetic of all the types. And his two puny bugs are about as threatening as he is. In just a few turns, both of his Pokemon are washed up by water guns, giving us an easy first badge. In fact, that was so easy to the point that I don't feel safe knowing that this man is protecting my city. Regardless, now we can head to Route 2, where the road has now been prepared. But before we go on, I need to recruit another hero to our roster. So who's the most heroic Pokemon you can possibly think of? Of course, the answer is... Bidoof. 
this holy rodent is exactly the kind of power we'd need going forward. But I think we can do one better, because what's better than a Bidoof? A golden Bidoof. So, being the idiot that I am, I took on the mammoth task of hunting for the perfect form of our perfect partner. And so, I began hunting, and after a short eternity, I finally found... A golden shiny. Except this one's a disgusting caterpie. What a useless shiny that will definitely never come up again. Despite the setback, I continued to hunt, hopelessly finding nothing over and over again. However, after a much longer eternity, we found... Our golden star. It's so beautiful. I immediately caught the golden doofus, and now we would surely become the strongest poke hero in all of Metropia. To demonstrate our new power, I took on this pathetic trainer and... Oh, never mind. Pushing onwards through Route 2, we come across this mysterious masked man who hands us a literal machete. I cannot wait to issue out some razor-sharp justice with this thing. And shout out to the creator of this game, El Garabato. This game has some insane plot points and we're just getting started. Just as we approach the end of the route, we're confronted by... Trevor. He may be our second rival, but he gives some real youngster Joey vibes. Chilldrop cleans up his team no problem, clearing us to enter Seacon City. Immediately, we hear a loud cry for help. The city center is under siege by a poke villain. Someone should do something. Someone other than me? Ugh. Fine. So we stepped up to face the rogue poke villain, and hey, wait a minute, isn't that just Lance? I'm pretty sure that's Lance. Anyway, not Lance only has a ghost and a pet rat, who both fall without issue. Having now done his job for him, the second gym leader, Wilbur, emerges and apprehends the dragon tamer. First he gets an illegal dragonite, then he murders a team rocket grunt, and now this? Maybe Lance was the real villain all along. With peace restored to the city, now we can enter the second gym and take on Wilbur, who looks like a furry with a jetpack who steps straight out of deviant art. Before taking him on though, I decided to train our team a bit. In doing so, two things happened. First, Badoof learned rollout, which makes perfect use of his chunky frame, and more importantly, at level 16, Chilldrop reached its first evolution, transforming into whatever this is. Alongside the newly evolved Siduk, our heroic roster was ready for action in our next gym battle. The self-proclaimed Birdmaster leads with... A drift loon, which is absolutely not a bird, but whatever. It's irrelevant anyway, as our Bidoof is ready to cook. Defense Curl not only gives us some extra bulk, it also doubles the power of rollout. This means that Bidoof not only takes out drift loon, but it can withstand Staravia before blasting that bird out of the sky. While Wilbur's persona does slay our heroic bird, a water pulse from Siduk washes up Fletchinder, as well as the fiery feathered freak. That's two badges down. It had been smooth sailing thus far, but we can't progress any further until we help the police bring the road destroyer into custody. You know, the one we could have stopped, but let walk away completely uncontested. Still the world's best hero, by the way. After some searching, we find the culprit holed up in a bunker, hidden beneath a building. He seems to be working on some kind of teleporter, but eh, I'm sure that'll never come up again. We quickly clean up the criminal, just like last time, allowing us to make the arrest. Sir, you have the right to remain silent, but if you do not answer my questions, my Badoof has the right to chomp off your toes. Oh, never mind. We're just gonna let him get away. Again. With that criminal scum taken care of, now we can enter the airport, and it's here that we find her. Jigen K. Hi, Keegan. Are you having fun so far? Shut up, villain. You and your smirk haircut should be behind bars. After Siduk shows her the power of a real hero, our flight from Seacon City brings us to a desert, and on the way, our Lord Bidoof starts to evolve. But I refuse to let that happen. Our heroic golden Bidoof is already perfect. With our fantastic starter and a golden star, I feel like nothing can stop us. Wait, what? I'll teach you to stay away from Team Kaiser. Uh-oh. We're stopped in our tracks by this ominous-looking woman. And yeah, this looks a little dicey, but I'm sure that we can handle her. Oh, dear God. Uh, go get him, Bidu. We got decimated. Just as we were rising through the hero ranks, we were given a taste of just how powerful the pokey villains of this game truly are. But despite the loss, we can still pass through to our next destination. Welcome to Sand City, Metropia's most defended city. Most defended city? I just got assaulted right at the front gate. This city is bustling and there's a lot to do here. Like the Pokemon Gym, for instance, which doubles as not only a place for trainers, but it's also a police station. What a great combination. Children and criminals. More importantly, however, is... 
the casino. And as we all know, heroes gamble. What better way to forget about the evil ghost lady who just terrorized my team than spending hours playing Voltorb Flip. Truly, this is the most important thing on my agenda right now. And that's because this casino lets you cash in your coins for TMs, items, and most importantly, Pokemon. So I cashed in our chips to buy the newest member of our team, Bagon. Every hero needs a cool dragon, and while this dorky little bobblehead might not seem too threatening right now, it'll be a legendary hero in the future. So with our newly formed trio of heroes, I felt ready to tackle the gym, led by the electric type leader, Leland. He's also the police commissioner and uses the gym as a way to rehabilitate criminals. They told me you can either work here or get locked up here. Wow, uh, what crime did you commit? I wasn't subscribed to Keegan J. <laughs> my God, you are beyond help. I hope you rot in this cell. After putting my machete to good use, we stepped up to face the donut destroying police chief of a gym leader ready to dominate. Except that's not what happened. He's got four powerful electric types like Magneton and Luxio who do huge damage to our team. I did my best to hang on, but it was all in vain as our team is quickly shocked into submission. First the spooky lady and now this, our hopes of becoming the top hero of Metropia were feeling grim. Regardless, like a true hero, we don't back down. I charged straight in for a rematch. This time, our Bidoof is able to beat Leland's Electrike lead, and against the Elekid that follows, we just survive a low kick before a dig from Bidoof wipes it out. My lord Bidoof, you are a god. Our Doofus does immediately fall to Luxio, but this allows us to unleash our Bagon, who, of course, misses a Rock Tomb straight away. Nice one. However, it does hit the next time around, lowering Luxio's speed. From then, two headbutts clean up Leland's ace. All that's left is Magneton. Crucially, Bagon just survives a Magnet Bomb, which allows us to connect with one more Rock Tomb for a vital speed drop. After a lucky critical hit bite does huge damage, Siduk is clear to crush those Magnets, and our three heroes had clutched up. My confidence is back, baby. Best hero ever. Our celebrations are cut short, though, as an explosion just went off. Team Kaiser have bombed the police station, freeing a bunch of villains. And the lead culprit, the Shadow Woman from earlier, who we now know as Morgana, one of Team Kaiser's commanders. She's retrieved an imprisoned evil doctor, and to make things worse, she's left us to fight a killer robot? What is this game? And why is it so cool? While we quickly clean up the antagonist androids, despite our best efforts, Morgana escapes. Things are starting to look very worrying for the future, is what I would say, except someone mysterious stops us right outside the gym. Wait, is that a person? They look like a tent. Whatever they are, they reward us for protecting the city by offering us an egg in this trying time. So, of course, I immediately cycle around like a lunatic to hatch it as soon as possible. Now, dear viewer, what do you think is in this egg? A togepi? An eagerly buff? Or maybe we get lucky and it's an Eevee? Well, how about a shiny Honedge? Not only is this a fantastic Pokemon, but it looks so sick. Hexcalibur the Honedge will be the sword that we wield to fight off any villain that comes our way. Unless, of course, it's a normal type. With Sand City behind us, next we move on to the desert of Route 4. Here, this police officer informs us of a villain outbreak. So, being the good Samaritan and hero that I am, I quickly banish all of them to the Shadow Realm. For such a heroic act, surely I'm entitled to a cash prize or a golden statue in my honor, right? Uh, I can give you this crummy TM open up your wallet. After trekking through a nearby cave, we eventually arrive in Fort Village, where the next gym is located. We've been getting beaten up lately. Can things get any worse? Oh, why are you here? Jig and K blindsides us into a battle, and frankly, Bidoof is not having it, rolling out like an Autobot all over Jigen's first three Pokemon, no problem. This leaves our rival with only Whipazard, the evolution of the Grass Starter, which sadly looks a lot less dopey than before. While it does finish our Bidoof off, the combination of our Sacred Sword and Dorky Dragon is all we need to get the final knockout. Once again, we stop evil from prevailing. Wow, Keegan, thanks for a fun battle. Stay back, you unholy evil.
evil demon? Now we can explore Fort Village, but uh, there's not a whole lot to do here. It's a mining village in the mountains, and everywhere is closed off except the gym. This gym leader deals in ground types, and I don't think Fort Village is ready for the whirlpool they're about to experience. Sidhu cleans up all the trainers in the gym, no problem, before we eventually reach the leader, and whoa! Okay, so we've gone from a furry to a police officer to a literal Gundam. This game has been insane so far, but it's going to get even more unhinged soon enough. For now though, it was time to earn our next badge. And it starts really well. Siduk immediately wipes out his lead and would have had Don Fan too, if not for the fact that Don Fan has Sturdy. This allows it to fire back with Thunderfang, which does enormous damage. While we do wash it up on the following turn, this summons Clint's Excadrill, and it wants blood. Seriously, in four turns, this demon gets four kills, wiping out my entire team in the blink of an eye. This game is not pulling any punches. Not only is the game borderline insane, it's also really hard too. We would definitely need to bring out A game if we wanted any hope of becoming Metropia's strongest hero. So after some backtracking and some shopping, I had a new plan for tackling Clint. This time, once Donphan emerges, we tactically switch to break it sturdy. Now Sidhu can re-emerge and it wants revenge. With an onslaught of skulls, the remaining ground types are washed into the mud, cleaning up Clint no problem. Also, please don't crush me. With four gym badges to our name and a quartet of top tier fighters, nothing could possibly go wrong. Team Kaiser's right outside, aren't they? Like clockwork, another part of Metropia is under attack, this time by another Team Kaiser commander, Eruption Man. Not quite as subtle as Morgana, is he? Apparently, he wants to make the concerningly named Mount Burning erupt before attacking the ruins found in Fort Village. And this raises an important question. Who should we put to the task? An established leader equipped with a literal mech suit or a child with a sparkly bidoof? Obviously, the latter. Unwillingly, we charge through a slew of Poké villains and killer robots as we ascend the mountain before reaching the peak and things are already getting worse as Eruption Man catches a Moltres right in front of me. This man has a literal legendary, but for some reason, refuses to use it. As stupid as it seems, I'm not complaining. Captain Magma over here decided that a team of fire types was all he needed to beat us, but we have our secret, forbidden, heroic technique that has been passed on in my family for generations. Siduk, go. Four skulls flush out his entire pathetic team, and Eruption Man is angry. He looks like he's going to explode. Thankfully, he's not going to challenge us to another battle with Moltres. Okay, he's challenging us to another battle with Moltres. Look, in fairness, I deserve that. But that was way uncool, Fireboy. He defiantly declares that Metropia will once again be under the control of Poké Villains, which, uh, as far as our record goes against Team Kaiser, they're not wrong. So we retreat back through the ruins to get to Fort Village, and along the way, we find an ancient statue which gives us nine mysterious tablets. Wow, that's convenient. Hopefully no one needs any of these. Doctor, Reggie Gigas was holding eight of the 17 tablets. We're still missing nine. Well, we'll have to kill anyone who has the others. With a bunch of bloodthirsty Team Kaiser grunts ready to take us down, we're mercifully saved by Mr. Evangelion in his robot suit. With our powers combined, we clean up the remaining grunts while the Doctor makes his escape. And as if things couldn't get any worse, an army of killer robots approaches our flank. But we're true heroes, and so, faced with a dangerous foe, we make the heroic decision to run away. The plot of this game is already wild, but it's about to get even crazier, because now, Luca is here. He's come to give us a safe police escort, which should in no way be intercepted. So now another bridge has been destroyed, and to make matters even worse, we're attacked again by Morgana. Thankfully though, she only has a bonnet, so this shouldn't be too difficult, and... Wait, she can Mega Evolve? How did she even get a Mega Ring? Much like the Moltres Massacre, Bennett brutally wipes out our team, once again leaving us at the mercy of Team Kaiser. Until the champion of Metropia emerges, Pokemon. Dude, is that really the best name you could come up with? Pokemon? What's worse than his name is the fact that this guy is terrible at protecting us, as Morgana's Jellicent launches us off a bridge. 
We wash ashore on a nearby beach, and we're collected by a good Samaritan named Flora. While we are safe for now, that series of events showcases just how powerful these villains are. I don't think I'm cut out to be a hero. I knew I should have just been an accountant. Thankfully, the game now gives us a brief window to collect ourselves. Soon after, we reach the next gym, and this one specializes in grass types, meaning it's mostly free real estate for us to grind up our team a bit. This EXP allows our dragon to finally metamorphosize, becoming the bouncy, blimp-looking, awkward middle stage, Shelgon, who, with its newly learnt flamethrower, is going to be vital in this gym. Remember Flora, the good Samaritan who just helped us? Well, she's the next gym leader, meaning her reward for helping us is having her Pokemon absolutely torched by young Shelgon. However, turns out she's no pushover. Not only does her lead Ferris Seed set up entry hazards, but she has a powerful Trevenant that's holding a life orb. And this is all she needs to utterly annihilate our team with Shadow Claws and Horn Leeches. Wait, did we just lose again? And to a Grass Gym? Lately, we had continuously suffered loss after loss, and I was really starting to doubt our team. So I went back to the drawing board and grinded up our team. If our opponents were going to rely on big brain strategies and competitive items, then we needed some extra firepower of our own. And how do we do that? Well, by taking our one sword and doubling it into two swords. Once our Hexcalibur reaches level 35, it evolves into the powerful beast that is Dewblade, which is still such an awesome shiny. And with our hero dual wielding swords, Flora was ready for the wrath that she was about to experience. We melt down her Pharisee with a single flamethrower, we burn through her Whippersard, Torch Trevenant, Overpower Grottle, and trim her Roserade down to sides with Dewblade. That gives us our revenge, as well as a comprehensive fifth gym badge. However, once again, Team Kaiser emerge, ready to ruin my good mood. As we try to set sail to the next city, a Sharpedo boat gate crashes, and no joke, the leader of the brigade threatens to kill the current captain. This game is hardcore. Oh god, this isn't just your regular killer robot, it's a Spanish-speaking killer robot. At this point, I've had enough of Team Kaiser. All they've done is ruin my day and I'm sick of it. Right now, I'm going to end everything they stand for. You know what? Actually, I changed my mind. I kind of like Team Kaiser now. Captain Sharpedo here is a former gym leader and model rocking a crazy looking claw with her hand. Despite the voice in my head telling me to join her and become a full-time simp, she challenges us to a battle and her water types would be really threatening. But our starter knows the move Energy Ball, which is insanely powerful and a hard counter. So we begrudgingly crush the beauty's team into the dust while also saving the captain's life. To crown this achievement, however, our starter finally evolves into its final form, Sea Guardian. And again, no idea what this is meant to be, but it's a super powerful water fairy type, and that is huge. The game then cuts away to Team Kaiser's leader, who asks how progress is going. And for us, not great. They've captured both Articuno and Zapdos on top of the Moltres from earlier, meaning they now have all three legendary birds at their disposal. So that's bad, and it was about to get even worse. Is that a giant mecha tyranitar? Yes. Yes, it is. And we have to face it in battle. It's absolutely huge and proceeds to brutally take out three of our Pokemon. Thankfully, our final hero just hangs on long enough to narrowly pull out the win. This game is ridiculous and I am loving it. While on our way to the next village, we meet the walking circus tent who now introduces himself as Tetsuna. He's one of the elite four and considering that he gave us such a powerful Pokemon, I am dreading what it'll be like to face off against him later. For now though, by traversing a dingy cave, as well as some haunted woods, we stumble into Undechi Village, where gym leader number six resides. And thanks to our newly found Duskstone, we can evolve Dewblade into its final and coolest form, Aegislash. Our team was looking real good right about now. Our team of heroes had no trouble in quickly securing the next badge, and we were cruising. Until he emerges. Kaiser Ferdinand, the leader of Team Kaiser. He challenges us to a fight, and at first, I wasn't feeling too afraid. But then he began it by immediately mega evolving his Agron. Even without a huge level difference, his Agron then proceeded to wipe through each and every one of my Pokemon like a hot knife through butter. It was a beatdown. And so, the supervillain mugs us of our nine tablets before kidnapping Professor Lily. This plot is twisted. Team Kaiser 
Kaiser are now on the cusp of dominating Metropia, and we are stuck behind bars. However, Luca, the absolute Chad, breaks us out of prison in a real Shawshank Redemption moment. After dodging patrol robots and beating up the guards, eventually we reach the evil doctor that Morgana rescued. This introduces us to another villain, this Pokey Terminator. No joke, that leaves us with seven different villains that all want us dead. Us, the child with the shiny Bidoof. Fortunately, unlike Kaiser Ferdinand, we can take on the Terminator no problem before catching up with the evil doctor who is fusing the legendary bird trio together. Trust me, I've seen what happens with that before. Not a fan. To delay us, we're forced to take him on. And while he has powerful Pokemon like Slacking, Snorlax, and Porygon Z, we can handle it quite comfortably. One thing I do want to point out though is that he has a low punny. I know why you have that on your team, you creep. Sadly, we're too little too late as the Doctor has already combined the three birds, creating a new ultimate Pokemon, Meta Quattro. And we beat it quite comfortably. That was anticlimactic. Kaiser does inform us that he has far bigger, far more evil ambitions. But in order to stop him, we're going to have to beat the final gyms. But this wouldn't be easy. And after some of the insane fights we've had lately, I knew that I needed to first round out our team. I went far and wide over Metropia, searching all over for the best candidate to join the team. Nothing was sticking out though. None of these Pokemon are worthy enough to become heroes. But then it hit me. We had to go... Back to the casino again, baby. And after some more Voltorb flip, I decided to purchase another Pokemon, Togepi. The adorable little egg that I named Omelette, except Omelette has the ability Hustle, which is straight garbage. So welcome Omelette 2 to the team, everybody. And it has Hustle 2. Uh... Third time's the charm though, as Omelette 3 has the elusive Serene Grace ability that I wanted. With this little guy on the team, I couldn't wait to get him up to his final, most powerful and heroic form. Well, that was until I realized that I might have the most stubborn Togepi in existence. Seriously, despite gaining 20 levels, this little dude just stays in its baby shell. Why don't you love me enough, Omelette? Is it because I threw away your siblings? Okay, that explains a lot. For now, I gave up on winning the affection of Togepi and instead turned my attention towards the next gym. The leader is a spiritual old dude with psychic types who looks about ready to be sliced and diced by Hexcalibur. I, Samuel the Thinker, will test your judgment training Pokemon. Cool story, how about you test this? That win means that we're one badge away from taking on the champion, but we know the drill by now. Who from Team Kaiser are we going to have to fight? Kaiser Ferdinand, a Spanish killer robot, or the woman I can fix? If you answered any of these, you're totally wrong, as it's time to face the Mecha Tyranitar again. It does end up fleeing, but we track it down to a dark alley where we discover the puny pilot of the robot. Seriously, dude, you don't look like a villain. You look like you should be at a convention. His team consists of powerful fossil Pokemon, but it's it's nothing that our team can't prevail over. So the Tyranitar resorts to straight up assaulting us. Finally, a Pokemon villain not afraid to throw hands. Thankfully, we're saved from this beatdown by the final gym leader. Although Morgana once again ominously appears, stealing away Tyranitar as their plans are almost ready. That is definitely concerning. But with our heroic quartet and a stubborn egg, we still have one more space on the team for a hero. And fortunately, the route just outside Penta City has exactly who I'm looking for. So to round out our team of shinies and non-shinies, I committed to a long hunt, spending over an hour running into regular Pokemon again and again, while also finding ugly shinies that no one would ever want. Until the stars aligned and we found a shiny Riolu. I love these yellow streaks on it. It looks so sick. With an appropriately colored quick ball, we added Alpha the Riolu to our squad, finalizing the team that we take with us to combat Team Kaiser. However, both Togepi and Riolu need to actually like us before reaching their fullest potential. So I said screw it and cycled between these trees over and over again for what felt like years, just trying to make this stupid egg love me enough. Fortunately, this technique worked perfectly, meaning Meaning that our egg has finally cooked enough to become a longer egg, Togetic, and Riolu respected us enough to evolve into the amazing shiny Lucario. Now we had a stacked and ultra powerful team before the climax of our adventure. Oh, and Bidoof is here too. 
He is absolutely necessary. With these powerful Pokemon, including three counters for Dark Types, you'd think we'd crush the Dark Type gym leader, Dorian. Right? Wrong. While his Sableye is easy work, his Drapion critical hits our Lucario in one shot, but the real threat was something I was in no way prepared for. Malamar. It just has all the answers for my team. Like Night Days, a Dark Type move that lowers our accuracy, as well as Sludge Bombs to cripple our fairies. I didn't even know it could learn that. In just a few turns, we had been clobbered. That was a horrible sign. Struggling against the final gym leader before we face off against an onslaught slot of the toughest villains in any Pokemon game. This game is no joke, and we would need to be on our A game from here on out. So, in a rematch, we did just that. Sigardian absolutely crushes Sableye with Moonblasts, giving us an easy lead. Then, against the problematic Drapion, we pivot around to avoid damage, before locking Drapion into Poison Jab with Encore. This allows Lucario to safely enter the battle, and while the menacing Malamar re-emerges, we've boosted up with Swords Dance. It then hits a massive flamethrower, but we take it out with a brick break. Wait, why was it super effective? It's part psychic. That shouldn't work. Oh, that Malamar was definitely an imposter. The real Malamar can finish off Lucario with the Dark Pulse, but we're in the driver's seat now. Our team can gradually chip away to take out Dorian's remaining team. Despite his ace being Mega Tyranitar, a critical hit from Sigardian clutches up the fight, giving us our final gym badge. Of course, this all precedes the big issue, as Looker informs us that Team Kaiser are already on the move, looking to finish things up. This is it. It's us versus Team Kaiser. As we arrive at the bottom of Mount Ferris, we learn that Professor Lily's Klefki has been kidnapped and it's all down to us to save it. So as we ascend, we immediately spot Kaiser Grunts doing everything in their power to stop us by taking out a bridge. What is it with you guys and your obsession with destroying bridges? To tackle Team Kaiser, we needed every advantage possible and we could do just that with one promising evolution. As at level 50, our Dragon Blimp emerges from its cocoon becoming the ultra-cool Salamence. Now our team was ready to cook, which is great timing because we're immediately stopped by the Pokey Terminator and 84 killer robots. Well, we had a good run, everybody. This should absolutely be the death of us. However, we're saved by all the powerful gym leaders and Hercules. They distract the killer robots as we rematch the Terminator. And our newly evolved Salamence isn't taking any prisoners. With powerful moves like Fly, Crunch, and Earthquake, Salamence utterly destroys the Pokey Terminator's first five Pokemon. So what does it do in this situation? It throws itself into the battle. This could be trouble. Damn, Salamence, you didn't have to embarrass him that badly. Next on our hit list is the bold beauty, Captain Sharpedo. She was a bit of a pushover last time, but with her powerful team of six, it's still super easy. After a very quick beatdown, Captain Sharpedo has a certified heated gamer moment as she hopes we die in a fire. No, it's true, I can still fix her. Third on our hit list is Captain Magma himself, Eruption Man. And I'm not over what happened last time with his Moltres. He argues that he can hold his own, but in Instead, he can hold this L. Sigardian heroically drowns out every Pokemon in its way without a problem. It was a massacre. All I will say is that we see the final evolution of Blazebee in this fight, and looking at it now, I don't think that I should be showing this on YouTube. Anyway, this paved the way for our fourth major enemy, the Mecha Tyranitar, who seems to be talking to us from an interesting location. His team of rocky fossils were threatening before, but Aegislash can take out his Rampados and Probo Pass without issue. It's only when he sends himself out that we run into trouble. But Salamence stares down the mech with no concern and crushes it with Earthquake. And with the rest of his team following soon after, we have toppled four villains. Now we've reached the peak of Mount Ferris, where Pokemon, the champion of the region, mind you, pleads with us to take on Kaiser Ferdinand. That is your job, old man. Do something. Of course, it isn't that straightforward, as we're interrupted by Morgana. And considering the history that we have with her, this one's personal. Morgana has decimated us in the past, but this time, Sea Guardian was ready for blood. Our heroic starter crushes her Spiritomb with Moonblast, as well as her Jellicent with a critical hit Energy Ball. And while Chandelure does deal some damage, a Scald in Retaliation can wipe her out no problem. Fourth is Dusknoor, so I whipped out our most deadly hero, Bidoof. 
our golden boy manages to land a yawn, putting Dusknaw to sleep. And this gives us the window for our sword to slay the demonic Dusknaw. And with Salamance chomping down on the remaining ghosts with Crunch, we had finally bested Morgana. And it's all thanks to Bidu. You better like and subscribe for how much he did in that battle. Though we've defeated every villain in quick succession, we're still too late to stop Ferdinand, who summons this portal using the plates he's collected. Undoubtedly, this would be our final showdown. Inside the portal is a realm to Arceus, who Ferdinand summons and begs for them to join him. However, he can only prove his worthiness by taking us on in battle. And considering his team, this is not going to be a pushover. His lead Aegislash starts by hitting us with Toxic, but Togetic locks it into an encore. We both switch out, and while our own Aegislash has been a beast this run, Mega Agron is a huge wall. Brick Breaks don't do much, while Heavy Slams do huge damage. Alas, as a holy sacrifice, I hard switch into Bidoof to get smushed, giving Ferdinand the early lead. Fortunately for us, our starter is an absolute hero. A Scald luckily gets the burn, massively nerfing Heavy Slam's damage, and Ferdinand's decision to heal means we can take out the Mega in the next two turns. Next in is Electros, and not only does it finish Aegislash off, but now the text is all tiny and I can't read it. You're truly diabolical, Kaiser. We switch into Salamance and trade blows. Thanks to both Leftovers Recovery, as well as a critical hit, we best the Electric Eel. Next is Swampert, who we can hit for big damage with Fly, but an Ice Punch destroys our Dragon. An Energy Ball is a great retaliation, however, and while Cross Poison from Crobat hurts us, Water Spout is still enough to get the one shot. Fifth this High Dragon, who can't withstand a super effect Moonblast, leaving Kaiser with only his Aegislash. In response, I send in our shining hero Lucario as one final earthquake buries that sword, giving us a massive win. Having defeated Ferdinand, Arceus literally roasts this man before disappearing. But I'm sure he's learned his lesson and will be quite rational about all of this. I'm gonna kill you! Pokemon once again emerges just in time to save the day. And with that, we had conquered the evil team threatening Metropia. Or at least, that's what I believed at the time. For now, our own sights were set on becoming champion, as well as the strongest hero in all of Metropia. So, we head towards Victory Road, and this place is insanely tough. By the end of it, Bidoof was the highest level on our team. Seriously, our shining Bidoof has gotten super buff now. Everyone will fear him. Besides Bidoof, we also found a shiny stone, meaning we can finally perfect our team by stealing Togetic's legs, making it an all-powerful flying fairy, Togekiss. After a long hall though, we finally make it to the Pokemon League. Before we can take on the Elite Four and the Champion, there's a small tournament between eight trainers to prove our worthiness. So, after some more team prep to make our Pokemon as powerful as possible, we were ready. First in our gym challenge is the most diabolical villain of this entire game. Oh, you think I'm joking? You think Team Kaiser's world domination was a lot? Well, this Pokevillain in front of us carries six of the same disgusting Pokemon. B-Barrel. I'm not kidding. This guy carries six of these things. Thanks to Lucario spamming close combat, we can safely take them out, cleaning up the worst Bidoof-related villain we'll ever come across. This tournament also has us tackle both of our rivals, but after sweeping those two fools straight into the trash, now it's time to take on the Elite Four. While these trainers are tough, boasting some of the toughest Pokemon in the entire region, so are we. Against the Dragon Tamer, Long Zhu, our fairies blasted those mythicals with Moon Blasts and Dazzling Gleams, with Aegislash clutching up against Mega Salamence. Against Against the fighting type master, Mars, we... Hey, hang on a minute, that's just Bruno. You're not fooling anybody, dude. And he definitely wasn't fooling anybody with his plays, as Togekiss cleaned up his first four fighters without even breaking a sweat, and Salamence bested Mega Blaziken not long afterwards. Bruno, you can change your name and run away to a fan game, but you'll always just be Bruno. After the fairy type fanatic Diana has her whole career ended by an onslaught of Iron Heads, our Elite Four final battle stood before us. This one is Tetsu. Enough. And considering that he helped shape our team of heroes, it's only fitting that we defeat him using the very same Pokemon that he gave us. So, after our heroes sent his steely soldiers to the Shadow Realm, we had conquered the Metropia Elite Four. First, we bested the tournament, then we conquered the Elite Four, and now, all that stood before us to become champion was the game's biggest hero and biggest threat to our path to becoming Pokemon champion, Pokemon. Wait, why does he look like Duffman? But don't let his appearance fool you. This is one of the strongest champion teams you'll come across in a Pokemon game. Incredibly strong, ridiculously bulky, and even broken at some points. We were coming for the crown, but Pokemon threw everything he had at us, and 
It was brutal. Seriously, despite our best efforts, our team was thrown around time and time again. I attempted this fight over and over again, only for us to fall at the final hurdle repeatedly. His Mega Kangaskhan, Pseudo Legendaries, and Shiny Melotic were just so incredibly powerful. But we persisted, trying again and failing again. I believed in our heroes, and we just needed that one window, that one fraction of luck for our heroes to shine. And then... His lead Darmanitan does big damage with a rock slide, but a scald from our starter draws first blood. Next in is Metagross, so we switch into Aegislash for a Steel-type showdown. Since we resist its attacks, we're safe to boost our attack one final time, tanking Meteor Mashes, before a powerful Shadow Claw slices Metagross in two. Third in is Crocodile, which threatens Aegislash with both of its types. However, I have a devilish plan. By using King Shield, there's a chance that this Pokemon won't go for Earthquake, but instead, Pursuit. This not only does nothing to us, but also lowers Crocodile's attack by two stages. This drop is huge, as we can bring in Salamence on an Earthquake that does nothing before we can start cooking with Hone Claws. With the attack drops, Crocodile is doing not a lot, while we can recuperate health with leftovers, letting us boost our attack without losing much HP. Earthquake finishes the Killer Croc, and the otherwise bulky Milotic can't withstand a single fly from our boosted beast. Fifth in is Dragonite, and it's a face-off between two pseudo legends. Despite the power boost, Dragonite is still somehow able to withstand a Stone Edge, setting up a scary Dragon Dance. We then trade turns as Pokemon heals, and we luckily continue hitting Stone Edge, bringing Dragonite into the red. Having withstood our hits, the Orange Oak slays our godly dragon. Fortunately though, we can safely bring in Togekiss, who quickly secures our fifth knockout, leaving Pokemon with his final Pokemon, Kangaskhan. And this thing is such a menace. Seriously, Mega Kangaskhan outspeeds our whole team, and its ability in this game means that every hit does 50% more damage. It can absolutely sweep through our team here. We have only one hope, for Togekiss to survive and land a Toxic. So Kangaskhan fires off a super-powered return and... We survive! The once stubborn Egg Baby had clutched up hugely, leaving Kangaskhan on a timer. And with a huge assist from King Shield to help stall, that's all we need for Kangaskhan to finally fall in a few turns. With that, we had bested the dorkiest looking champion in Pokemon and become the number one hero in Metropia. So that's it, right? We've registered in the Hall of Fame and we're done here. No. You couldn't be more wrong, because the heads and tails post-game is wild, and it would be a disservice not to talk about this chaotic masterpiece. So, strap in. As a reward for becoming champion, rather than getting something cool, like a new Pokemon or a key to the city, we're instead recruited as the top hero of Metropia, tasked with fighting off any evil. But since Team Kaiser have already been defeated, I'm sure that won't happen anytime soon. Okay, I'm genuinely speechless. So, a city is now on fire, and it's due to this guy, a half-human, half-Bidoof, called Bidoof Boy. And considering we have a perfect Bidoof, I think that we have the authority to say that this is sacrilegious. Even worse, BB's ace is a golden Bidoof of his own. He's an imposter! Thankfully, his team is just six rodents, but surely there's nothing weirder than that left in this game. There's something way stupider up ahead, isn't there? Okay, so this is a lot to take in, but all these bizarre characters are merely henchmen to this one-eyed leader who has it out for us. Great. This goes directly onto the next story, which involves us escorting Trevor to the bank before the evil team decides to throw a bomb, and now we're attacked by a bunch of bigger rocks. Guys, I'm starting to think that we actually died like seven gyms ago. Anyway, this subplot focuses on the Catastrophic League, a bunch of weirdos led by Darwin, a specialist in Mega Evolution, so much so that he can break the rules. You're only meant to be able to Mega Evolve one Pokemon, but this guy does it twice in one battle. Breaking the sacred rules of a Pokemon battle? This man is truly beyond redemption. That was only the warm-up though. Trevor and I then storm their hideout before fighting off against a pair of henchmen. And this introduces us to a ton of wild characters along the way, such as Giant Lady, Royal Slacking, and Two-Face. Unfortunately for them, they're not the main antagonists in this story. So, as the top hero in Metropia, we clean them up quickly. They're not our focus though. What is our focus is Darwin, who has a doomsday device designed to mega evolve every Pokemon in the region. This guy is literally the incarnation of everyone begging Game Freak to bring back Megas. Wait, could you mega evolve my Bidoof? Uh, it can already evolve into B-Barrel. 
How dare you? It's on, old man. Unfortunately, Darwin Megastone is not taking things lightly as he now has a full team of six and all of them are Megas. However, as Metropius' next top hero, it's our duty to step up and slaughter his team like dominoes, one after another. Even in the face of an evil rule breaker, our team's unstoppable and I'm sure that'll never change. During a short subplot that follows, we discover that a thief has appeared and is trying to revive a legendary ice totem to rule over Metropia. And the thief's name is... The Refrigerator. Okay, I feel more threatened by an eagerly buff. We ascend the snowy mountain to try and stop the snow totem from being summoned, but the refrigerator stands in our way. And befittingly, Mr. Fridge is also an ice type specialist. <laughs> Yeah, that's about right. Regardless, he's still able to summon the totem before it betrays Mr. Fridge, and now we have to face it in action. Yeah, that's about right. So, that wasn't too crazy, but this next part is absolutely ridiculous. This time, the developer of the game themselves appears. He's the developer of all Pokeballs, including a brand new one. Surely that won't go wrong. Master Scribble is his name, and he's trying to auction off his evil inventions to make billions. So, of course, we have to put a stop to his money-making ventures, as well as fix the Pokeball situation. Doing so culminates in three fights against him, the first of which we have to put our differences aside with our arch nemesis, Jigen K, to fight against a shiny unbound Hooper. That's already a ridiculous creature to face off with, but then Master Scribble manages to one-up even a shiny mythical by making us fight a fighter jet. Yes, you heard me right, a jet. Somehow, destroying the Doom Jet doesn't explode and kill him though, so we face off against him for a final time. Not only does he have an incredibly powerful and versatile team, he even has his own unique Mega Evolutions. That's so sick. Mega Crobat looks even angrier to be alive, so we do it a favor by putting it out of its misery, arresting the tyrannical CEO for good. Okay, so we had Badoof Boy, 10 Weirdos, Frosty the Snowman, and then the developer of the game. Game. What's next? An alien invasion? It's gonna be an alien invasion, isn't it? Yep, of course. The cities are on fire, and now we're getting into fights with UFOs and aliens. I miss when we were just fighting a shirtless loser in a wooden mask. So after escaping the alien abduction, then we meet this alien fighting police team. There's no chance that they could possibly be evil too, right? Look, this section of the game becomes really unhinged. Basically, we have to fight an alien leader, Mithra, who uses all of the Deoxys forms. But after blowing Blasting off the aliens, we can finally take solace in the fact that Metropia is completely safe from every villain ever conceived. And then he came back. The villainous Mr. Apocalypse, who had been foreshadowed right at the start of the game. He attacks the Pokemon League, and not only that, he kills Pokemon. He was easily my 12th favorite champion in all of Pokemon. Can we get an F in the comments for Pokemon? The morning after, Mr. Apocalypse comes to our house and threatens our mother before declaring his sights on ruling Metropia once again. After he leaves, we're called to an emergency meeting at the Pokemon League where it's confirmed we'd have to go to the Battle Frontier, defeat the six major henchmen that held the keys to his tower, and eventually challenge Mr. Apocalypse at the summit. And let me tell you, this post game was extremely hard. I can't truly do justice to it in just one video, but you have to go into a bunch of mystery dungeon style towers, facing off against team crisis grunts with ridiculously powerful teams before eventually reaching the wild character that is each tower's boss. All of which provides an interesting, amazing, and sometimes just outright weird opponent to face off against. It would be an injustice to the game to try and commentate each one one by one. But once I'd received every key, however, the final ascension of this game began. This involved rematches with some of our arduous opponents like Darwin Megastone and his brand new Mega, Mega Rhyperior. I've never seen a Pokemon that embodies regret quite like this one. And after clearing through the next two battles against Kaiser Ferdinand and a mind-controlled Professor Lily, we finally meet Mr. Apocalypse on the roof of his battle tower. This would be a decisive battle to protect the world from his grasp. Except... It's not that easy, because Mr. Apocalypse is one of the hardest fights I've seen in any Pokemon game. All level 100s, including Legends, Mega Evolutions, Harried with Contrary Superior, and even a deadly washing machine. This is an absolute powerhouse of a fight. Naturally, I got stomped on over and over. Even if you are able to conquer his shiny Victini, Mega Magnazone, and Mega Machamp, his ace in the hole is a shiny Mega Rayquaza. This is so 
so unfair. We were going into this fight with an underleveled quintet and a nice Badoof. Loss after loss piled up and it just felt hopeless. In spite of everything we'd done, from stopping Team Kaiser to preventing an alien invasion, we just didn't have enough left in the tank to conquer this fight. Or did we? Despite all the losses, our heroes continued trying. We just had to hope that the stars would align. His lead Victini will use one of two moves, Bolt Strike or Zen Headbutt. Since we lead with Sigardian, we desperately want the latter, which it does use this time around. And although a Scald leaves Victini with a Slither, after it's healed the following turn, another one hits the range to take it out. This brings in Rotom Wash, who we can't stop from zapping our beloved starter into oblivion. However, now we can bring in Salamence and try to set up. A Hone Claws boosts our attack, but of of course, Mr. Apocalypse hits the tiny chance for Thunderbolt to paralyze. This means that while we can fire off a painful Dragon Claw, it's not enough for the KO as Rotom secures its second kill before Lucario quickly gets its revenge. Next in is Machamp, who Mr. Apocalypse Mega Evolves, giving it even more arms. How much power could you possibly give it? Even though we quad resist close combat, Togekiss is still nearly hit for half of its health. Thankfully though, a single Dazzling Gleam is all we need to finish off the Hex armed menace. Fourth in is Magnazone, who looks terrifying after its mega evolution, and we don't have much of an answer for it, as the oversized magnet takes out our third team member with Charge Beam. It was down to a 3 versus 3, where both of us have a god as our ace. Close combat cleans up Magnazone, and now Mr. Apocalypse decides it's time to bring out Rayquaza. Even in shield form, our Aegislash can't survive a single earthquake, and it's over. We just don't have the heroic capabilities to win this. So, I decide to send in our Bidoof, who stares up at the menacing Mega as a Dragon Ascent rips into Bidoof and... We survive on 1 HP! That's all thanks to our Focus Sash, baby. In the 11th hour, Bidoof clutches up by hitting a Yawn. And while an Earthquake brings it down on the following turn, Bidoof fulfilled its mission, putting the Legend to sleep. And this tiny window is all we need for Lucario to re-emerge, set up a Swords Dance, and, with the power of friendship, destroy Rayquaza with Return. And thanks to one last close combat, the final Superior is plummeled into Oblivion. With that, Mr. Apocalypse was defeated, and we had finally secured peace for the region of Metropia. Jump into this video next for more Pokemon content and subscribe to the channel as a sign of respect to our heroic Bidoof. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.